So if you think you can, and if you think you can't, you're absolutely right, because you are what you think. Because your mind doesn't care. Your mind doesn't care if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, healthy or unhealthy, it just believes it. So who, li who likes to have proof that everything I'm saying is true? So I'm going to give you a crash course in how to run your brain in 25 minutes, and you really can do it. So I've always been fascinated by human behavior and how the brain works, and I've spent most of my adult life studying how the mind works, which is why I became a therapist. And I was very lucky because I got voted best therapist in Britain and got voted the best of the best in Tatler and in lots of other magazines too. And I only tell you that because that opened so many doors for me and suddenly I'm being flown all over the world working with Olympic athletes and rock stars. And that was great for me because then I got a chance to really look at how people's brains work. And I was fascinated by how people who've got everything have a bit of a different mindset. I had two types of clients, those that had everything and loved it, and those who had everything and thought, how quickly can I fuck this up? And it was really interesting how their mind worked. So when I was studying to be a therapist, my teacher, who was very eminent, said to me, well, he said to the whole class, the mind is really complicated, it's extraordinarily complex, it takes a lifetime to understand and a lifetime to master. And I thought, well, how's that going to work then? Who's got a lifetime to work with their patients? Not me. I haven't even got a lifetime to sort out my own brain, let alone someone else's. So I thought that was a strange thing, that we're taught our mind is complicated, complex, takes a lifetime to master. Maybe by the time you're 90, you might have got it worked out, but that's a bit too late. But I found three things, and in my own school, I've been teaching them to people who are now becoming extraordinary therapists too. So you need to know three things about your brain, and I'm going to tell you what they are, and you're going to put them into practice, and I promise you, it will change your life, and you can have pretty much whatever you want. So let's start with number one. This is how your brain works. It does what it thinks you want it to do. Sadly, it works off information you gave it once upon a lifetime ago when you were six or 10 or 15. But your mind is always doing what it thinks you want. It's always doing what it truly believes is in your very, very best interest. So if any of you here have got a habit you'd love to be free of, but guess what, you still got it? Your mind thinks, no, you don't really want to be free of that. And anyway, it's better for you to keep it. On the other hand, if there's a habit you'd love to acquire, like speaking in public, being really successful, believing in yourself, not eating junk, your mind thinks, nope, it's in your best interest to keep that habit. And so I kind of, everything I'm going to teach you today, I didn't learn from a book, I learned from my own patients. And I was told I could never have children, and I just have to get over it. But I knew even then I wasn't going to believe that. And I'm very much known as a therapist, therapist. So when doctors can't get anywhere with their patients, they send them to me. And for a while, because I was told I was infertile and then proved that not to be the case, I worked with infertile women and almost always got them pregnant, usually by the very next cycle, even if they hadn't had a period for 10 years, because you really can feel miracles when you understand how the brain works. So doctors would say, okay, this patient has unexplained infertility. Well, what does that mean? It means I can't explain it. There's nothing wrong with their body. They have periods, eggs are fine, husband sperm's fine, can't have a baby. So they'd come to see me and I'd usually regress them back. And they always came up with the same thing. Where are you? I'm 17, what's going on? Oh my God, I think I could be pregnant. My dad's gonna kill me. I'm gonna get thrown out of the house. I'll get kicked out of school. Where are you? Oh, um, you know, I'm, I think I might be pregnant and I'm gonna lose my job. Or uh, sometimes you just go back to normal things like saying to their boyfriend every month, for God's sake, don't get me pregnant. That would be a nightmare. And now the brain is very clear. You don't want a baby. God, no, you've used nightmare, hell, disaster. My dad will kill me. You don't want a baby. And now the brain is very clear. You don't want a baby. It's like, no, that was when I was 16. Now I'm 36. I've just spent 20 grand on IVF. I really do want a baby. But the mind doesn't catch up with you. We think we're so smart and our mind is so evolved, but it is often stuck in the past. So who here has done this? Who here has said... I'm dreading going to that meeting next Wednesday. Why did I volunteer to speak? I'd give anything not to have to go and chair the meeting, speak up, go. Anyone ever done that? Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? 
Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to chair that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I'd die if I've got to go on stage. I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday comes and you wake up with diarrhea and your brain's like, how cool am I? You can't even leave the bathroom, no, let, let alone go for that meeting. Who here has ever said, I'm so stressed, I'm pushed to the max here, I'm at my limit. What I would give for a weekend in bed just lying around, your brain's gone, oh, do you want the flu? I could give you that tomorrow. Now there you are in bed. And of course, that's not what you wanted, but you've got to be very, very clear with the brain because this is your brain's job and it really is a specific. Your brain's job is to keep you alive on the planet and it does that by moving you away from anything it thinks will cause you pain. So when we were tribes people, we didn't really wander too far from the tribe. We didn't eat anything that looked a bit odd because we survived by linking pain to something. And, and life hasn't changed. Anyone here ever eaten something that's made them really, really sick, like mushrooms? Still eat them now? <laughs> Anyone had really bad food poisoning? Anyone find they cannot now eat that food that they were up all night bringing up over the toilet? Sure, because when you go, oh my God, I'll never eat seafood again as long as I live, your brain remembers. Next time you see seafood, you kind of feel a bit odd and think, oh, no, I can't eat that. No, no, no. So your brain's job, very clear, move you away from pain. So what do you think happens when you drive to work going, this traffic is killing me. I am dying in this job. My client is hell. My boss is a nightmare. I'm up, going up the wall with stress, well, your mind goes, um, okay, let me just get that again. Your job is killing you, your boss is driving you crazy, you're up to the wall with stress, and you're dying under your paperwork. Well, I don't think you should go back to that job anymore. So I can make you really sick so you can't go, and if you ignore me, I'll just make you sicker, I can give you an ulcer, I can give you panic attacks. That's what the mind does. So I'll give you an example. One of my clients was telling me that when he was a kid, he had to read and read out loud. And he had to read out stomach. And when he got to it, he read stomach. My stomach ate. And all the children laughed, and even the teacher laughed, and he went bright red. And his brain starts to search for, oh, what's making you so stressed? Oh, you read out loud. You drew attention to yourself. Everyone laughed at you. Don't ever do that again. And so many, many, many years pass, and he decides to go for an interview. And his brain's like going, what are you doing? Don't you remember what you said? You were never going to draw attention to yourself again. You seem to be going for an interview. I'll make you really anxious and nervous, and then you won't go. For other people that study, they go, you know, I, I thought I could do that public speaking, but actually when it came to it, I was so nervous, I pulled out of it. And I've never done it since. That's one group. Second group, ignore that and go, no, I've got to do it. I want to do it. And they do it under terrible duress. They're anxious, they're stressed, and their brain's going, hello? Why are you ignoring all these fantastic illnesses I'm coming up with to get you off that stage? You appear to be on that stage, so I'll just crank them up even more. Third group, they're much smarter. They dialogue with their brain very, very, very differently. So let me give you an example. Who here's got their own business? Or would like their own business? Okay. So when you have your own business, or you write books, or you speak, you often have to work weekends. Sometimes you have to work nights. And so if you're sitting at home, this is you going, oh God, I've got to spend all weekend writing. This is so hard. It's really boring. All my friends are in the pub. Your brain's like, you don't really want to do that. Why don't I have you tidy up your sock drawer for three hours and empty out your, your emails? Because you don't want to do that work. And you go, no, I've got to do it. I have to do it. It's so boring, but I must do it. And your brain's like, uh-uh. I'm going to distract you because your brain's job is to pull up resistance if you don't want to do something. So it's really poor communication saying, I've got to and I have to and it's really hard and it's dull. And it isn't just using words like, this is a nightmare, this is hell, just saying this is so boring. Oh, this is, this is so dull. It's enough to get your brain to say, move. So this is how you communicate with your brain. You say to it, I have my own business. I really want to do this. I have chosen to work through the night. I've chosen to do it. I've chosen to feel great about it because I've chosen to be successful. And your brain goes, you really want to work all night? Yep, I really want to work all night. And I'm going to say, it excites me to work all night. It empowers me to work all night. It thrills me. My brain's like, yeah, I got it. Great. So instead of making you resist, I can just give you loads of energy and I can set you on fire and you can work all night because you told me you want it, you like it, you've chosen it, 
and you've chosen to feel great about it. So I learned this technique when I was working. I used to work on a lot of shows with very fat celebrities with the idea that we'd get them very thin. And one day we were working with some Marines in Wales and the Marines were running up a hill. It was pouring with rain. They were running through sheep shit. They had half their body weight on their back and they had a miner's light on, strapped onto their head. And so they're running, running, running. And the brain's going, um, yeah, this is a bit weird. You're running up a hill in the pouring rain. You've got a miner's light on your head. You've got half your body weight on your back. It's freezing cold, but you're singing. And of course, because the Marine's singing, the brain's like, yeah, well, I guess you like this stuff. I mean, you're singing, you must like it. I don't have to do anything, because you like it. And that's why people sing when they're doing something difficult. Now, the celebrities, okay, here's the miner's light. And they go, if you think I'm putting that miner's light on my head, you are out of your fucking mind. There's no way, excuse me, swearing, I'm going to wear that. You think I'm going to run through sheep shit in the rain at seven o'clock at night? I'm not doing that. And of course, they couldn't do it because they said, I'm not doing it. Whereas when you say, I've chosen to do this, I want to do this, this excites me, it empowers me, then you get what you want. So let me just move on to, how many people have done this, asked, thought I want some time off and got really sick? Let's go on to our next slide. Because this is not positive thinking, it's nothing like that. This is clear, specific, detailed, precise communication with your mind. And when you're detailed, you get whatever you want. Because your mind doesn't care. Your mind doesn't care if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, healthy or unhealthy, it just believes it. So who, li who likes to have proof that everything I'm saying is true? Stand up and let's have a little bit of proof. So I want you to remember this. Your mind does not care what you tell it. If it's positive or negative, good or bad, healthy, unhealthy, it just goes in. So I want you all to take your left arm and I want you to point your left arm out like that. And all you're going to do, we'll have a little rehearsal so you don't poke out your neighbor's eye. All you're going to do is that. So you might need to come forwards or out a bit. So all I want you to do is everyone take their left arm and I want you to take it as far back behind as it will go. Push it to where it is. Now look over your shoulder and just notice where your left arm is. That's all you have to do. Notice where it is. Bring it back. Drop your arm down again. Close your eyes. And you're going to have a bit of amazing proof now. I want you to tell your left arm in a minute. When I repeat this exercise, you will go a third further. You are super flexible. You're like Play-Doh. You're like elastic. You're like a bendy doll. And you are going to go a whole third further. And now I want you to see all the muscles in your shoulder like spaghetti, cooked spaghetti. So believe your arm is super, super, super flexible. See it going further. And now tell it, you will go a third further. Don't move it yet. See it going further. Tell it to go further. Open your eyes. Lift up your left arm and just watch as it goes a whole third further when you do it again because you told it to. So now you have the proof. You can never again go, I I'm rubbish at this. I, I can't do that. I knew I'd get that wrong. I knew I'd mess that up. We're going to do another one. So stay standing up. These are all fun. So we we'll just do one more. It's nothing humiliating or embarrassing. It's all cool. Just put your hands by your side and put your feet together and close your eyes. Just keep your eyes closed. And I want you to imagine right in front of your chin is the most powerful magnet, an enormous magnet. It's so super powerful. It is pulling you forwards, forwards, forwards from the chin. Your whole body is leaning, tipping, hinging. Your chin is moving forwards. Your shoulders are moving forwards. You're bending from the waist. Your knees are locking. You really, really want to come up onto your tiptoes as that magnet pulls you and pulls you and pulls you. And now I want you to imagine it's changed position. It's gone right to the back of the back of your head. And this time it's pulling you backwards, backwards, backwards. Your head is going backwards. Your shoulders are going backwards. Your knees are locking. Your toes are trying to come into the air as that magnet pulls you backwards, backwards, backwards. And finally, it's gone to the left of your left shoulder. Your whole body is pulled 
over to the left by this powerful, powerful magnetic force. You're like a weeping willow in the wind and you are pulled over to the left more and more and more. And now just open your eyes and take a seat. Because <laughs> there's no magnet. That's your mind, how powerful your mind is. I would really love it if they teach this stuff in school because once you know how powerful your mind is, now it's your fault. Before you can say, I didn't know better, it's not my fault, I describe myself as an idiot. Now you know better and it is your fault. So you're not allowed to do that anymore. No more diminishing yourself. So let's just do one more. Um, you can all see that lemon, can't you? Put your hand in front of your mouth, just like that. Close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that you're holding half of a big, fat, juicy lemon. It smells like the most best lemon smell ever. You can feel that great, lemony, waxy thing, and you can inhale it, and you can really feel this juicy lemon. Now open your mouth and cram that lemon in there. Shove it in and start sucking it, and biting it, and chewing it, and just go to work on that lemon. And of course, what's going to happen, what's happening is that your mouth is filling up with saliva right now to a thought. And open your eyes. Thoughts are things. Whatever you think, your body agrees. The mind says yes, the body says yes. It doesn't really work the other way around. So you've got to say yes to better stuff. So how many of you do this? I just got a new PA. She's amazing. But every time I, she said, oh, my God, I wanted to die when I got the job with you. Oh, this boy just asked me out. I want to die. And I'm like, I don't think that is going to work out until you stop using that word. So who says um, it's hell in Tesco's? It's a nightmare on the M25. My commute is killing me. Put your hand up if you use any of those words or ever have in your lifetime. Sure. And you have to change that and just go, well, it's a challenge in the traffic. It's, yeah, it's a little bit boring being in Tesco's, but it's not hell because you respond to the picture. So let's go straight on to step two because it, it what figures in very well. The first thing about your brain does exactly what it thinks you want it to do, what it thinks is in your best interest and what you told it years and years ago. And it's up to you to change that and go, yeah, you know, I didn't want to draw attention to myself when I was 12, but now I'm like 52 and I, I really want to draw attention to myself. I want to have a great business. I want to ask for a pay rise. I deserve it. I'm worth it. I matter. I'm significant. Because the second thing about the brain is, and this is really interesting, it responds to two things. Only two things, there's nothing else. It responds to the pictures you make in your head, and the words you say to yourself. So a patient rang me up last year and went, could you help me? I can't merge. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because I can't merge. I can't merge because I've got these companies all over England. I have to drive from London to Manchester, Manchester, Edinburgh. And I have to go on all the A roads, B roads, because I can't merge on a motorway. But now I've got to give people lifts and I can't tell them I can't merge. I'm like, oh, come in. You'll be merging in 24 hours. It's fine. But as it happened, I had to drive to Manchester with my husband. And we were driving back really early in the morning. It was still dark. And it was raining really badly. And I had to overtake a juggernaut. And I was thinking about my client, thinking, wow, what that must be like not to merge. And as I thought about it, I thought, oh my god, I can't merge. I'm halfway past this lorry. And I have forgotten how to merge, because I'm thinking his thoughts and seeing his images. And I had to very quickly stop and go, come on, you know how to merge. You put your foot down, you follow the curve of the road, and you say, I can do it. And then I got back into the inside lane, and I thought, I could wait my husband would say, baby, you've got to drive now, because I can't merge. But I thought, this is silly. Of course I can merge. But, you know, when you take on someone else's words and thoughts, you start to feel like them. So I'm flying to Spain to see a client. And I'm in the queue to get on the plane. And um, this woman is crying hysterically. Her husband's begging and pleading, come on, babe, get on the plane. They're gonna, and, the, and the staff are going, well, she's not getting on the plane. And we're taking off her luggage because she's not getting on the plane like that. And I'm like, oh, no, it's going to be a disaster. I I'll help her out. I would have helped her. And I said, listen, what is the matter? She said, I can't get on the plane. I'm like, why not? And she went, well, look at it. That looks like a flying coffin. And I'm scared that if I get on, I'll never get off. And I'm like, oh, right. Well, you know, that would make anyone scared calling a plane a flying coffin. You could call it a flying sofa, maybe. But flying coffin, that's not a great word. And so I asked her a few questions and said, you know, what did you do yesterday? And she looked at me. I said, I know what you did. She said, well, I said, you did all your laundry, didn't you? She went, how did you know? And I said, because people who think they're going to die 
tidy up their house. She goes, yes, I always do that before I go on a plane, and then I usually can't get on it. I said, look, you know, you don't even have a fear of flying. You have a fear of not being in control, but I'm going to fix it. So I was telling her this story that I took my daughter to Disneyland, and I thought we were going on a little ride that went like that, and it actually went like that and like that, and I, my brain was being thrown around my skull. My daughter was screaming because she hated it, and I thought, well, I could scream too, but that's not going to help her. So I started going, oh, yay, this is fantastic. I love this. This is amazing. I, I really didn't. I can't, can't tell you how much I didn't, but it confused my brain, and then it confused her brain, and she was just going, yay, I like it too. And when we got back, she said, did you like that, Mummy? I'm like, no. But I wanted to confuse myself. She goes, oh, mommy, you confused me because I thought you loved it. So I'm telling this woman this story going, okay, we're going to get on the plane. I'm going to hold your hand and we're going to pretend we're in Disneyland. We're going to go, I love this as the plane takes off. We're going to go, yay, this is great. So I explained to a lot of things. We got on the plane, I held her hand. And as it took off, she looked at me and went, oh, my God, this is like... Why is it this easy? I'm like, because it is this easy. Your brain responds to two things, the pictures you make and the words. And when you go, yay, this is fantastic, you have a different reaction. And she said, so should I lie to myself? I'm like, absolutely, all the time. A hundred percent, you should lie to yourself and lie. Because, you know, we think we're so smart. We think we've we've evolved. But, you know, when you go up to the top of the shard, I went up to the top of the shard, I went to the edge and my, I had to do that and walk around it. And I wasn't remotely scared, but my body was going, get away from the edge because its job is to move you away from pain. So you respond to the pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. So here's a thought. Anyone here not having the most amazing success at being on a healthy diet? Anyone failing to avoid pizza and chocolate and ice cream and Ben and Jerry's and not finding themselves going for a run at six o'clock every morning? So this is what happens. You're in a restaurant. Let's pretend this is a menu and you go, oh my God, they have burger and fries and pizza. I love all of that. Oh, it's my favorite. An apple crumble with custard and double chocolate fudge ice cream. And you go, but I'm on a diet. I'm having the salad. And your brain's going, salad? No, 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 you love all that stuff. Last time you, you ate it, you went, oh my God, this is better than sex, it's so good. And now you're gonna deprive yourself of it. And your brain's going, eat the pizza, eat the pizza. You go, no, I'm having salad. And your brain's going, salad? When did that ever give you intense pleasure? Don't be silly, eat the pizza. So you go, okay, now you think, now I feel so bad I ate the pizza. Your brain's like, eat more. That's why it's called comfort food. Now, now I've eaten more pizza, I feel bad. Your brain goes, eat some ice cream, have a beer. So this is the wrong way to go. I love chocolate, I'm never having it again. All my favorite things I'm giving up for you, I'm never eating ice cream again. I love it, it's yummy, it's I can't have it. And it doesn't help with what they call it, divine and love and celebration and hero. So the way to do it is to go, oh look, they have pizza, yeah, I like that, but you know what, I like being a size 10 way more. I like fitting into my jeans way more. And there's pizza. I can have that when I'm 96 right now. I wouldn't look good in my clothes and maybe out of them too. And your brain's like, you don't want the pizza? No, I don't want the pizza. I want to be really fit and healthy and I've got pizza for the next 50 years right now. I'm choosing to look good in my clothes because I'm 95. I'm not going to look good in my underwear no matter how thin I am. That door is shut. And then I can have loads of pizza. And your brain's like, oh yeah, I get that. I get that with your language. You've said you could have it. You're choosing not to. It makes you happy not to. It thrills you not to. It empowers you not to. And then all resistance goes away. Because you just change the pictures. Instead of thinking that cake looks nice, you go, yeah, it does look nice, but it doesn't look as nice as I look when I fit into my clothes. So who here, when you look at this picture, what do you see? So I'm going to give you four reaction straight away. Oh, that's really painful. Or yeah, I'm going to get off my head. Or oh, I'm going to look 10 years younger tomorrow. Or this is going to take away all my pain. You see how you can choose. I mean, I have clients who love doing that to themselves. And they're not street junkies. They're major movie stars who think that's fantastic. I have women who have so much surgery. They love that too, because you can choose what that means. You can choose what everything means. You can choose when you got on a plane, either those pictures. You can choose what this one means. You know, is that really hell to be in a traffic jam? Well, hell is actually not having a car or any money to run one. Is it hell going shopping? No. When I was in Cuba, we lost all our luggage. We went to get more and they went, we haven't got anything. We haven't got anything. We don't have any provisions in Cuba. There's nothing to buy. That's hell. Actually, I have to say it was quite liberating, really. But 
you can't go to shops and go, it's hell, it's a nightmare, it's a disaster, until you go somewhere else and see what it is really like. So let's come to the very last part of my talk, which is the thing that therapists find the hardest, making what is familiar unfamiliar and what is unfamiliar familiar. So your brain loves what is familiar. It really wants to go for what is familiar. And if you want success, you've got to make unfamiliar familiar. Really hard work, applying yourself, but most of all, extraordinary self-belief. That will take you further than anything. So whatever you haven't got that you'd like, make it familiar. And if there's things that you've got that you don't like, make them unfamiliar. If you, if you lounge around every morning on a weekend and start to go to the gym, that becomes familiar. So I worked with a lot of women on shows, and we do makeovers and make them look really pretty. And the minute the camera stopped rolling, they take all the makeup off, put their tracksuit on, and go home. And I worked with one once, and she went, yeah, I don't know what you've done to me, but it's really changed. And I met this really nice guy, and he took me out, and he opened doors, he bought me dinner. I don't think I can see him again. He's too good for me. I said, no, no, no. It's unfamiliar. You know, your dad trek, you're like, shit. Men that do that are familiar. And now here's a nice guy. And you're just going to sit and go, I'm going to make this familiar, make this familiar, make this familiar, and make the other stuff unfamiliar. And of course, it worked. And here's the thing that I find the most interesting. People who've never had praise, that is so unfair. If you say to them, I love that type of guy I got it in Primark in the sale, it only cost five pounds. Or I love your talk. Yeah, but I left out the best bit. And the other person was much, much better than me. So if you do that, here's a tip. Make praise familiar. Make self-praise really, really familiar. And make criticism unfamiliar. People can say things. You don't have to let it in. So I want you all to close your eyes. And, you know, I, I worked with this very interesting guy whose parents had abandoned him, and they were really horrible to him, and he became very, very successful. And, and they got him to buy them a lot of stuff, but they never praised him. And then his dad died without ever telling him he was worth a bean. And one day I said to him, you know you're a good son. I put my hand on his shoulder. He sobbed uncontrollably for 10 minutes, and I had to say, look, let this in. You're a good son. Your dad's not going to tell you, but I will. So I want you all to think about what is the one thing you would have loved to have heard. We all want the same stuff. You're a great kid. How lucky am I that you're my kid? How lucky am I to be married to you, dating you, living with you? You're a great employee. You're great at your job. You know what you need to hear. I don't have to tell you. Close your eyes. Think of what you most wanted to hear now or 30 years ago, and say it to yourself now. I am, you can do it in your head or out loud, no one's listening. Just say it right now. I'm a good person, I'm smart, I matter, I'm successful, I'm significant. And just say it over and over and over again, because you're gonna make that so familiar, that the old voice is unfamiliar. And here's a great thing to end on. Studies have shown over and over again that depression is usually caused by harsh, hurtful, critical words that you say to yourself over and over again. Make that unfamiliar. Tell your brain what you want. Take responsibility for the words and pictures you use. Make great stuff familiar, negative stuff unfamiliar. I promise you, you can have whatever you like. Your mind does what it thinks you want it to do. This is probably one of the most powerful rules of the mind. Here's your mind's job. It's got a very clear job. I'm your mind and I'm going to do what I think you want. And when you say, oh, this commute is killing me. My boss makes me want to die. My kids are making me go up the wall. I am stressed out of my mind by the freeway. Your mind goes, oh, you keep telling me that something is killing you. It appears to be your job or your commute. Why don't I just give you a lovely ulcer and then you can stay home and avoid that place that's killing you? It's, that's its job. Why don't you do your job and talk to your mind better? The commute is a pain, but I have great CDs to listen to. I have stuff to do. My boss is difficult with everyone. It's not me. He's not there and I'm having sex with my wife. He's not in the room and we're having a lovely dinner. This is temporary. He's an unhappy person. Do it better. 
You will get what you want when you tell your mind what you want, but here come the words. Let's imagine you're going to give a speech, and the words are, oh my God, I'm freaked out. I'm, I'm terrified. I, I'm going to go bright right out my mouth and go, oh, I, I haven't got the time right. I, I, I'm so nervous. Your mind goes, do not get on that stage. If you walk to that stage, I'm going to give you a massive panic in the middle of the room because you told me you don't want to do it, and I've got to do what you want. Or you can go, I am fantastic at speaking. I've got something to say. People like me. What I have to say is a value. Speaking to a stage is like speaking to my wife or husband. And then your mind goes, get on that stage and do it. You always have a choice, but your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want. When you go, I want a week off. Who's ever done this? What I would give for a week off lying in bed, your mind goes, leave that with me. Now you got the flu. How cool am I? I listened to you. You wanted a week off lying around watching Netflix. Now you got it. That's not what you wanted. You need to say, I need some time and I'm like a battery. I need to recharge and I'm okay at working full out all week because at weekends, I recharge like a battery. Now your mind understands, but saying, I'd give anything not to have to chair that meeting. Your mind goes, how about a nice dose of diarrhea? I can bring that up for you. You don't want to chair that meeting? You said I'd do anything not to go. I'd rather kill myself than give that presentation to my boss. Your mind goes, oh, don't kill yourself. I just give you a really upset stomach. Now you can't even leave the bathroom. There's no chance you're meeting your boss done what you wanted. I know I'm making it funny, but it is funny that so many people don't understand your mind's job is to do what it thinks you want, and it bases that on one thing, the words you use and the pictures you put in your head. And here's some great news. You can change those words and change those pictures like that. And when you do that, it changes everything. So, your mind tries to move you towards pain, away from pain and towards pleasure too. Very, I mean, so many kids are going, you know, I want to ask out this girl, I want to talk to that boy, but I'm so nervous they won't like me and they're going to reject me and laugh at me. And, and if they keep doing that, the mind's going to go, no, don't go there, stay the way you are. So you have to say, people like me, I'm, I'm a great kid. I get all my young kids to write on their mirror, I'm an awesome kid. I'm enough. And it really changes them because they start to feel it. I'm an awesome kid. I can talk to a girl like I can talk to my friend. And then they feel okay. But if you keep linking pain to them, your mind goes, don't go there. Don't go there. And if you link pleasure to it, you go there because you're giving your mind an easy job. I've got to work on my website all weekend and all my friends are in the bar, so I can link pain to that. It's not fair. It's not fair that I've got to spend all weekend writing when I could be in the pub. Now your mind's gonna go, I think you should tidy up your sock drawer, make sure all your forks face the right way, then plump up the cushions and then go to the pub. Because it's very clear you do not want to work on your website, but oh boy, getting those forks and knives in line is really compelling. Who's done that? Most of us do that. I suddenly need to do the laundry, which I don't even like. I'm tidying up my house because I'm saying I don't want to write that bit of work. How about saying it thrills me to work on my website? I'm elated working on my website. There is nowhere I'd rather be in the whole world right now than sitting in my office working on my website. Your mind goes, I'm going to set you on fire now. You're going to be doing this till two in the morning. You told me you love it and it thrills you. Let me fill you up with energy and passion. I'm a writer, I know how this works. I never go, oh my God, I've got to write a book. It's so lonely, it's so isolating. And what if no one likes, what if it goes on Amazon, they go, I hate that book, and it gets no stars. Or I can go, I love writing. How cool is it? I get to write and people pay for my books and they like them and they give me great reviews because there's the choice going on again. So whatever you want, you must link massive pleasure to what you want, and you can link pain to what you don't want, but I, I don't bother to do that. Let's think of all the pain, your book's never published, you go into your coffin, it's still in a drawer. It, you don't have to do that, just focus on the pleasure bit. I'm a writer, it's amazing, my book is published. I used to always imagine 
my book in stores. I'd imagine going to an airport, see people reading my book. And when I did, it was like, wow, but your mind went, well, I took you there because you showed me very clearly what you wanted. I had that image to take you to because what you want wants you. And what you are moving towards is moving towards you. Don't move towards fear. Don't move towards failure. Don't move towards it going wrong. Move towards it going right. So we've actually done the next bit. Your mind responds to the pictures and words. The fastest way to change anything is to change the pictures and words. And it's such an easy thing to do. I'm terrified, I'm elated, I'm useless, I'm amazing, I have no memory, my memory is compelling, I can't speak to people, what I have to say is easy, I find it easy to speak to anyone. This is the most vexing rule of the mind for every therapist and coach in the room. It's the one my clients have the hardest time with. Your mind loves what is familiar. If your mind could choose, it would stay with what's familiar and never go to what's unfamiliar. We're in a walled city. And that's interesting because years ago at night they shut the door and we stayed in the wall. We didn't think, do you know, I feel like going for a midnight stroll. I think I'll wander around. I'm a bit bored of being in this same old, same old. I want some variety. I think I'll open the gate, wander off and find another tribe. They might have killed you or eaten you. We learnt familiar made us safe. Who here notices with their kids and they literally want the same cup? the same bowl, the same cereal. I took my daughter to Finland to see Santa Claus. She watched Little Mermaid in Finnish the whole time. And she didn't, that was okay in Finnish because she knew, she'd watched it 110 times where I'm like, babe, here's Father Christmas, here's only mummy. I want to watch The Little Mermaid. It's like, well, next time we'll just stay home and, and watch a movie then. She did actually get into it, but it made her feel good. She used to play this game. She had so many Barbies and Ken would come up in his car and he always picked the same one. He never picked another one to go to the ball because they like familiar. It makes them safe. You know, how many kids you have, they want the same story every night. But familiar also makes us safe. So here's a rule of the mind, and it's a very important rule to put into practice. My mind likes what is familiar, and it doesn't like what's unfamiliar. Okay. But I can make anything negative unfamiliar and anything positive familiar. Let's start with praise. It's the most simple but the most powerful. I meet clients who are never praised. I met one girl whose dad said, you're so rubbish, just like your mother. God knows what you've got going. If any man asks you out, snap them up because you are nothing. You're not interesting, you're not attractive. When you get pregnant, you'll blow up just like her and be a big fat mess. So if anyone wants to be with you, I can't imagine why, take them. And she heard that a lot. So she had this interesting belief, I've got nothing to offer the world. And I did a lot of work with her and she went out and she went, it was just amazing. It was like magic. This guy came up and he asked me out and he was so nice. I mean, he actually made another date and he picked me up in his car and took me out for dinner, told me I was amazing. I'm never seeing him again. I'm like, really? She went, no, no, he was too good for me. I'm like, oh, let's change that wording to his behavior was so unfamiliar. I don't recognize praise or nice as somebody believing I'm worth something and I want to run back to the familiar guys I have to beg to take me out or seeing my friends, I pay the bill and they remind me of my dad and I'm like, well, guess what? You're not supposed to have sex with your dad, so there's a clue. If someone is like your dad, I don't think you should be getting into bed with them and I think you need to make the unfair, that people like it when you make them laugh. So she went, right, so I said, you need to go out with this guy and this is what you do, you keep saying, I will make this familiar. He rings me when he says he will. I make it familiar. He texts me. I'll make it familiar. I will make it familiar. And she ended up marrying him. She's very happy. She said, how weird. The other guy called me and said, what happened to me? She went, what, the guy who never called me? You never called me, so I just let you go. So you have to say, let's do it with all of you. How many of you find praise a little unfamiliar? How many of you find praising yourself even more unfamiliar? Okay, so if you're never praised and you're criticized a lot, and criticism is familiar, when someone goes, wow, I love that teacher, you go, I got it free, it's got a hole in it, I've had it eight years. I loved your speech, didn't you notice I missed out the best bit? No, I thought it was amazing. I hear you're the best salesperson in your team. Yeah, but not in my county, there's another guy way better than me. So if praise isn't familiar, you will reject praise, but you'll add in what's familiar criticism. 
So that one of the best things you can do that will change your life is to make praising yourself familiar and to make criticism unfamiliar. Don't do that day in life. Oh, I've got to look at my hair. Oh, there's a stain on this jacket. I'm an idiot. Oh, I didn't buy any nice food. Now I'm going to have to eat donuts. I'm such a moron. I didn't charge my phone. I'm a retard. I haven't got enough time to get there. I'm a loser. You know, if someone said over your work, going, well, it's not very good. Look at that. You haven't even spelt it correctly. And then all the way home, they went, you haven't left enough time. You're an idiot. You haven't got any nice food. Moron. How quickly would you kick them out of your life? Pretty fast, but when it's you, you can't kick yourself out of it. And when a friend is mean, you go, they're having a bad day. But when you're mean, your mind goes, well, it must be true. Everything you tell me is true. So you need to make praise familiar. It's really easy. I'm amazing, I'm kind, I'm nice, I'm real, I'm authentic, I'm a good person, I have something to offer the world, I have a unique skill. That's easy. And don't go, I'm an idiot. I'm a moron. I was telling my little girl off one day. She got very good. She said, Mommy, you are a silly billy. And I thought, well, that's a great word. So next time I'm about to say, you idiot, I go, you silly billy. Because it's just a word. If I said to my husband, oh, you silly boy. He doesn't go, how could you offend me like that? Because it's a word. It's how I say it. You're so naughty. He doesn't go, I know, I'm t I need some therapy. I'm so bad. I go, oh, that's, you're so bad. So it, it, you can make words. So I want you to think of the worst words you have for yourself. It's always the same stupid bitch, airhead, idiot, loser. And I want you to change it to silly billy. Because when you say silly billy, because you can't help it. I was changing a light once and my hand was wet and I nearly electrified it. And I was about to go, you stupid effing. And I went, you silly billy. Don't do that again. Because why beat yourself up? There's enough people in the world who'd like to beat you up. Why do you want to be one of them? Be nice. Show the world that you're worth it. So up praise massively and minimize criticism. If you wanted to change your life today, this will change your life. Praise yourself a lot and don't criticize yourself. And if you do go, yeah, but I did something really bad, go, well, I learned. I learned from that mistake, I'll never do it again. If it taught you something, it's okay. Don't beat yourself up. You're allowed to make a mistake. You are not allowed to beat yourself up, berate yourself and call yourself names and punish your body for doing what everyone does. They make mistakes. So to make a mistake is human and to forgive yourself feels really divine. And to call yourself a silly billy feels even more divine. So that's something I recommend you all do. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. How many of you sat having an injection going, oh my God, that needle's going in and it really hurts. You notice the babies don't do that because they don't know. So whenever I have to have blood taken, I get my phone out. It's the easy and I get completely, and I go ahead and I don't really notice it. But if I look at it, it's not the same. If you focus on pain, it hurts. If you focus on stress, you're more stressed. In fact, I had a client come up to work on stage with me and she was like this. She was shaking so much. And all my class would go, my husband was like, wow, I've seen you get people out of that, but I've never seen them start with it. And she was just shaking so much. I went, okay, I want you to shake more. I want you to really shake. Come on, Gwen, you can do better than that. Shake, keep shaking, shaking, shaking. I said, you know, have you ever seen a deer pursued by a lion? When it gets away, it doesn't go, I need therapy now. This is so traumatic, it shakes. It stands and shakes and it goes back to the herd and life goes on. And when I made her shake, what was happening is she began to think, oh, I'm in control of the shaking. I'm doing it, then I can stop it. And so when clients go, my knees are knocking, go knock them together loud, I wanna hear it. My hands are clammy, can you make them even more clammy? Can you turn up that sweating so you're dripping? Yeah, go on then. And then they, I say, and you see that you're doing it. What you focus on, you get more of. When they focus on, oh, I did that, and I can turn it down, it feels better. So don't be scared of clients that shake or sweat or start to laugh. So when they laugh, I go, I want you to laugh even more. I want you to almost wet yourself with laughing. Actually, I don't say that too often because that does put a bad, pic good picture in the mind. When people I say, laugh more, cry more. I laugh with them. Sometimes I cry with them. Whatever you focus on, you get more of. If you ski and you focus 
you'll go. If you're on the freeway and you focus on an exit hard enough, you'll take it without even planning to. So whatever you focus on, you get more of. Focus on great things and you'll get more of them. The strongest force in every human being in the world is that we must act in a way that utterly matches and is completely consistent with our thinking. I know I'm going to fail. I know I'm going to mess it up. I know it's going to hurt. I know it will go wrong. Now you have zero choice but to act in a way that's consistent with your thinking. I know it's going to be great. I know I'm going to sail through it. I can ace this. This is easy. Change the words. It changes your whole language, but everything starts with a thought. Everything, everything, everything begins with a thought. And here's the great news. Your thoughts are yours to change. And you can change your thoughts. It's actually incredibly easy when you learn that Everything starts with a thought. A thought is a word. And if you use words elated, empowered, ecstatic, blissed out, amazing, phenomenal, incredible, I'm stellar, I'm just amazing. And you can repeat the same words over and over again. I feel ecstatic. I'm elated. When I work, they say, I can't stand up to my boss. I can't tell my mum that she's actually the biggest bitch in the whole world who ruined my life. I go, well, how about thinking if you say that, it makes you feel elated. It makes you empowered. It sets it free. Because outrage is just rage that needs to come out. I said to my listen, your anger is like gas. Better out than in. She's not in the room. Let's do it now. I want you to say to your mum, Mum, you know, I want to love you more, and I can't because I resent deeply. And suddenly they go, you absolute bitch, you biggest bitch in the world. How could you do that? And they go, I feel so good now because it's that. And I can go home, and I can love my mum better because I've let the resentment out. So I never tell people to keep it in. I think feelings do their most damage when they're kept in, when they're repressed and pushed down. And most of my clients who binge and drink too much are pushing down feelings. The stomach is the seat of all emotions. You can't heal what you can't feel, but you should let feelings out. And if you keep it in, you always suffer, you always feel repressed. Many clients I see who say they are depressed are not depressed. They are repressed and they are suppressed because they can't say, I resent you for always saying that my brother was smarter. I resent you for marrying six different guys who are hideous to me and never putting me first. And then they make their peace and then they move on. You have to be aware of it. You have to accept it and you have to articulate it. I call it triple A. Be aware of your feelings. My ex-husband drives me crazy and I'm so angry with him and I can't tell him because he's the father of my kid. I get that. Shut the bathroom, turn on the taps and say you are the biggest ass in the world. Thank God I've got a great ass because I realize I don't need another one in my life and make it funny. God gave me a great ass. I don't need to marry one. I'm done with you. But say it and then you feel better and make it amusing so they don't think, oh, I feel terrible. She said I can say, I've got a great ass. I don't need to date one. And now I feel good. I remember that. They remember stuff that's funny and significant. So remember your thoughts form the blueprint. What you present to your mind, it will present back to you. When you go, I'm not enough, it goes, of course. And when you go, I am enough, it goes, of course. So we've already covered this rule that your mind doesn't care. We've covered every thought you think. Here's a great rule. When dealing with a subconscious mind, the greater the conscious effort, the less the subconscious ones. Who's tried to relax? Who's tried to sleep? Who's tried to remember? What's the name of that restaurant? I don't know. And suddenly, they, oh my God, it's just popped in my head. Your mind actually is like Google. If you need to remember, don't go, where's my keys? Where's my keys? My passport? Oh my God, I'm going to miss the plane. I'm going to get fired. It's all a disaster. Don't do that. Say to your mind, tell me where I put my keys. Remind me where my keys are and do something else. And it will pop in. Oh, of course, I came in and I put them next to the fridge. 
tell me the name of that restaurant I went to, do something else, your mind will do its job. You give it an instruction. Mind, go ahead and tell me where my keys are, where my wallet is. And it will tell you, it will pop it in your head. But when you try and start, you know the thing where you empty out the drawer? And then you go and empty it out again, and now you've emptied it out three times looking for your passport. You know it's not there, but for a fourth time, let's tip our handbag on the floor, pull out our drug, I'm missing the flight, oh my God. Everyone's gonna hate me, my kids are gonna be furious. Don't do that. Stress shuts down logical thinking. When you're stressed, your mind goes, there must be a lion somewhere. Let me pull all the blood away from your brain into your heart and lungs so you can run. I saw this in action years ago, I was walking home and this guy was following me and I lived in a basement and I got halfway down the stairs and I knew that he was gonna come down the stairs too and I, I got my key in the door and I couldn't work out. I thought, I've lived here for five years, I don't know how to open the door. So I was so scared, but I had the foresight to pull the key out and I had to stand back in the shadows, flatten myself against the wall. And he came halfway down, he couldn't see me and he left. But I wasn't gonna keep trying to open that door because when you're scared, your mind just disappears. You can't even remember your own phone number. So you have to fill up your mouth with saliva and pump it around, push your shoulders down, and then you're not stressed. But uh, it's very important when you want to remember something, don't try, ask your mind to remind you. And if you're in an exam and you think, oh my God, my mind's gone blank, fill up your mouth with saliva, swirl it around, push your shoulders down, and your mind goes, a wet mouth is a sign of someone who's relaxed. That's why we kiss, by the way, before we have sex. A wet mouth makes you relaxed. And so, don't do that, I can't remember, I don't know where I'm going, I'm lost on the freeway, oh my God, which road shall I take? I'm just panicking. Fill up your mouth with saliva and say, subconscious mind, remind me, I looked at the map, which road is it? It will tell you, because it's foolproof, but you've got to do it too, your mind works for you. You don't, whatever, put it to work. I mean, if you had a PA and went, okay, I'm going out now, just, um, just do the job, or hey, I'm going to Italian, could you decorate my house? Do you think you're gonna come back? And they've done it right? No, you've gotta go, this is exactly what I want. The more specific you are with your decorator, PA, or hairdresser, the more you get what you want. You don't go to a restaurant and go, oh, get me something to eat. I, I, I didn't want that. Well, you said anything will do. You gotta to talk to your mind that way too. So, uh, I think we pretty much got that. The mind can't hold conflicting beliefs. So let's go on to hypnotic language patterns. We have just enough time. Children can only work in the present tense. They don't understand tomorrow. My little girl said, okay, Mommy, is it tomorrow today? She didn't know what yesterday, today, and tomorrow was. She goes, is it tomorrow now? Is it tonight, today? Because they don't understand, they only understand now. That's why with a baby, when you leave the room, they think you're never coming back. And so children aren't really great at future pacing. Children can only respond to words that make pictures. The more vivid the picture, the more powerful they respond. So don't say you're a good kid. Say you are an amazing kid. What I love about you is you've got a natural gift for science. Or what I love about you is you're so good at cooking. What I love about you is how much you love learning. It doesn't matter if you don't get great grades. You love learning. The more you can make the picture good. See, I have so many kids who are twins ago. I was called twins. Twins, lunch is ready. Twins get in the car and they had no identity. Don't do that, don't dress your kids the same, don't say I love you because you're smart, because when you label a child, you limit them, even a good label, I love you because you're beautiful. Kids here, and if I wasn't, you wouldn't. Don't do that. I love you because you're lovable. And when you grow up, people are gonna love you. One of my clients said I can't find love. My dad just said to me every day, no one's ever gonna love you like I do. Well, there's a program. You say to your kids, you're so lovable, you're gonna find so many people who love you like I love you. So a child's mind doesn't recognize neutral words. How many people say to a baby, don't touch? And then they touch. Because don't is a new, touch. They know what touch is, don't touch, don't touch. Keep touching it, stop touching it. They can only hear the words touching it. So you can say that's very fragile and it's very important to mummy. As I say to my little girl, when you're walking across 
the house with a drink. I didn't, don't spill it. Don't, oh, look, you've spilt it now. I knew it. You always spill it. I go, darling, when you look at, when you, you got to look at the cup and not the television. And if you look at the cup while you walk, you'll keep it up, right? And then everything will stay in the cup. They understand stuff that makes a picture. Don't spill your juice. I guarantee they're going to spill it. Every day they go, you, you, just, you just can't stop spilling it. You're just a messy kid. And four days later they go, I'm so messy. I, I'm always spilling stuff. What's wrong with me? You are conditioned. That's what's wrong with you. But you can be unconditioned like that. So a child mind responds better to specific words and instructions. So they don't understand later. They do respond to positive words. You must, with children, eliminate every negative word. You're bad, you're naughty. Good kids do bad things. Smart people do silly things. Say to a child, you're a great kid. Why did you do that? That's not you. You're a good kid. And they go, well, you said you liked her more than me. No, I didn't. Well, I heard that. And so if you start with, you can't do it all the time. Our kids push our buttons. I say, you know, you're my teacher, darling. You're teaching me how to cope with someone who gets paint all over the carpet. My daughter's an artist. I'm tidy. She's messy. I wasn't designed to give birth to myself. How boring would that have been? She's nothing like me. I'm nothing like her. We learn from each other. It didn't make our life perfect, but it made it easier. So children also respond to you are, you can, you always, you do, you all know the story about the class that were given to a teacher and the teacher said, these kids are geniuses, we predict they're the best, and you are the genius teacher, we've done these secret tests, genius kids, genius teacher, we know you'll get genius results, which of course they did, and they went, well, we picked you at random, and we picked the kids at random, but if you believe something, it becomes true. So let's go on to the very last one. Children can't future pace. So when they're feeling sadness, it feels like it's going to be for the rest of their life. And they do this thing called tagging. I can't make my mummy happy. And it's always going to be this way. My, I don't have a dad. I don't have anyone to love me. It will never, ever change. We don't have enough money. It's going to be like this for the rest of my life. And so when you're working with children, I say to them something which I love. I say, look, darling, this is your life today. It's not your life. I know your dad's an alcoholic. I know your dad's in jail. I know your mum's working all the time and you live with babysitters. And I know that is your life today, but it's not your life. One day, you'll have a totally different life. They're not good at future pacing, but that one expression, it's your life today. You have no friends. I mean, I worked with a little girl who had no friends and was so bullied, and now this girl has got so many friends, because I always say, remember, it's just your life today and probably tomorrow next week. And I taught her not to want friends because when you have a little thing on your head that says, please like me, kids don't like that. They like, I like me. If you want to like me too, good. If you don't, you're lost. And I taught her to do that, to change her energy. She was inundated with friends. But they really respond to that word. And because children can't future pace, that's like when, a, when you're be, be, below two and the mother goes out, kids think she's not coming out. When you say, oh, my child's so greedy, I want it to wait to eat, they feel like they're never going to get fed again because they cannot future pace. And so when you're a therapist or a coach, when people say, you know, I, I wolf down donuts, I, I mainline jelly beans, what's wrong with me? Somewhere, somehow their parents have made them wait and wait or remove food as a punishment. You, you don't have that because you're bad or we can't afford that. And because the child's mind thinks it's forever, they act as if it's forever, even 40 years later. So the job of the child's mind is just the same as the adult mind. It does what it thinks the child wants to do. I don't want to go to school. I'm scared of school. And now I've got all these anxiety attacks and hives and eczema. I was a little kid who had eczema, and I said, darling, I know this is a crazy question, but if the eczema had a job, what would it be? And he said, well, when I stand like that and mummy puts the wet bandage on my eczema, he called it his sensible skin, couldn't say sensitive. He said, when she puts the bandage on my sensible skin, she shouldn't put any cream on that baby. And there it was. He told his mind as the mother did the, I want that. 
I want massage. I worked with another kid who had migraines at six, very unusual. As if the migraine was your friend. I know that's crazy, isn't it? But if you wanted to help, you went, well, when I get migraines, mummy and daddy stop shouting, they turn off the light and we sit in the dark until it goes away. So he'd obviously said to his mind, I wish I could stop my parents fighting. And the mind goes, let me come up with a solution. It may be crazy, it may be harmful, but the mind doesn't do, just let me have a solution. It doesn't think, is it good, bad, helpful, unhelpful, beneficial? It's just a solution. So children tag onto these painful issues of painful experiences and you can change it by getting rid of the tagging. It'll always be this way. It will never change. It'll be like this for the rest of my life. You can help them incredibly. And I'm talking about adults coming to my office and go, look, I know I'm a millionaire, but I can't spend money. I'm so worried it's going to run out. Because when they were a kid, they couldn't spend money. They didn't have it. So people hold on to this stuff. So I think we're just about out of time, but since we're talking about, I'm gonna tell you a very funny thing that happened to me. So I work with a lot of children and there's nothing better. One little kid said to me, Marissa, you are the magic person and you stopped me wetting the bed because you did magic. But all I did was tell her that when her tummy was full of wee wee, can't say bladder, that this magic Barbie light went up to her brain and she woke up and she sat up and she ran to the bathroom and then the next day she called her grandmother and said, grandmother, I'm dry. And then she went to sleepovers. I excited her imagination. I did it several times. In 20 minutes, that kid never wet the bed again. And she said, you did magic with me. Then I worked with another kid who said, Marissa, you're so cool, you do magic. And then I worked with a big hulking kid and he went, you're the bollocks. And I thought, isn't that interesting that the words for a man's genitals, a massive compliment for a woman, it's a massive insult. <laughs> so there's your language patterns. Being the bollocks is a huge compliment. <laughs> and being the female equivalent is a huge insult. So you have to make of words what you want to make of words. But if you use powerful words, you'll have a powerful life. If you understand the rules of the mind and put them into practice, you will be running the ship. Your, your mind is like a Ferrari and you're like a driver trying to run that Ferrari. The subconscious is the Ferrari, the conscious is the driver, I don't even know how to run this. But if you learn, you can handle a Ferrari. Think of your mind like a Ferrari and think of you like a hugely competent, highly skilled Ferrari driver. Take that Ferrari where you want it to go. Make your life incredible. I tell people all the time a great truth. Events don't affect you, but the meaning you attach to that event will affect you, or the way you interpret an event will affect you. You see, imagine if I was holding a needle in my hand right now, a big hypodermic needle. If you want a tattoo, if you want Botox, if you're in immense pain, that needle would please you. I'm gonna have angel wings all over my back and I welcome the needle. I'm in so much pain, I can't wait for that shot to take away the pain or, hey, I'm gonna have some little tweaks and treatments and I welcome the needle, it's gonna make me look younger. But if you're scared of needles, some people will let teeth rot out of their skull and will live with pain because they fear needles. So it's not the needle, a needle is nothing, it's how you feel about the needle. Imagine if I had one of my lovely cats on my lap right now. Some people love cats, so I'm, I'm terrified of cats. They bite, they scratch, you know, they carry this illness. I could have a lump of meat in my hand. And if you're a vegan, that would be offensive. If you're a Hindu, it would be even more offensive. If you're a bodybuilder, it would be lovely. So we have to understand the truth because it makes our life so much easier. An object will not affect you. A motorbike wouldn't affect you unless you're scared of going on it and believe you'll crash and you have no protection. A dog is just a dog unless you fear dogs, believe they bite you, attack you, or believe that they are man's best friend and you love all dogs. So that teaches you something, doesn't it? The needle, the cat, the dog, the burger, the aeroplane, the motorbike, it's not that object, it's how you feel about it. That's great news because that means you can change how you feel about anything all the time. You can change how you feel about it and you can change what it means and you can change the interpretation. It all comes down to the pictures you make in your head 
and the words you say to yourself. When I was a kid, I hated going to bed. I resisted going to bed. Bed was boring. That's where old people, I want to stay up all night long. Even when I was 12, the idea of not going to bed and staying up, and now I'm older. I love going to bed. Someone says, oh, let's go to bed. Let's get into bed. It's nine o'clock and watch a movie and read a book. And to me, it's heaven. Other people think, wow, that's super boring. But for me, I love getting into my bed and reading. So relaxing because I changed completely how I felt about that. My mother would never let me have pets. They were dirty. They scratched the furniture. They molted hair. We were not allowed cats or dogs. And my cats do scratch them and they do molt hair, but they give me so much joy and I focus on the joy. So you see, you get to choose the way you feel about anything, anything, anything is down to two things. The pictures you make in your head and the words you say to yourself. And if you like, you can make it even easier. The way you feel about anything is down to the pictures because the pictures make the words. I was going to a restaurant in London a couple of years ago and it's really high up, it's actually in the clouds and the lift goes really fast. And I got in the lift and it was exciting. We were going, oh my God, this is terrifying. Oh my God, look down. Oh, my stomach is doing somersaults. Oh, I don't like being this high up. What if a helicopter flew into the building? Well, those buildings have little lights on them to stop that. And when I've been to places like Dubai or New York, I see that people get really freaked out about heights. Other people will say, wow, look at the view. It's amazing being this high, how cool it is to have breakfast in the clouds. So you get to choose. If you change the words you construct and change the pictures you put in your head, you can change your entire life. You know, when I had my baby, I also could never have a baby. It wasn't possible I could conceive or indeed carry a baby to full term and I had my baby and I was in hospital with my little new baby. I was blissed out of my mind and a nurse came up and gave me Kleenex. What's that? She goes, that's for postnatal depression. I said, I'm not having postnatal depression. Well, well, you know, everybody gets it. Usually by day three, all the women are a sea of tears. I'm like, oh no, 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 you don't understand. I'm having postnatal euphoria. That's what I've signed up for. That's what I'm expecting. And she went, oh, one of those crazy therapists here. But I never said I'm going to get postnatal depression. I'm going to be so fat and it will take two years for the weight to go. And you never have a minute to yourself and you're exhausted. I decided to call my baby my nonstop joy. And I would sign up for postnatal euphoria. And that's what I had. I was blissfully happy. So you see, when you choose what languages you use, you choose how you feel. Imagine you're going to have to go and have a shot an injection and you go, oh, I don't like the needle. It pierces the skin. It really hurts. I don't want that. Or you could say, you know what? If I look at my phone as that needle goes into my mind, I don't even notice it. And if I cough at the very minute it goes in, my mind doesn't notice. So if you're scared and you go, I'm excited. I'm excited. This is exciting. Bring it on. I want it. You can choose the words you use. And when you choose better words, you choose a better life. And of course, it is a choice. I could choose to be super negative or super positive. That's my choice. But you know what I can't choose? What I do to my body when I am super negative. I had a super negative mother and a super positive father. They were great teachers. My mom was always ill. My dad was never ill a day in his life. And they were my teachers and I chose to be super positive because why not? You got nothing to lose and everything to gain when you pay attention to the words you use and stop saying, oh, this is a nightmare, this is hell, this is a living hell, this is driving me crazy, this will never work. What's the point? Make different words. Decide to commit to using powerful, passionate, exciting, thrilling, descriptive words that turn on your mind. If you decide to do that and deciding to do that, you are deciding to change your life. And decision is a Latin word. It means to cut off from. Decide to cut off from negative words. And you see, I have a situation right now in LA. My house has been flooded. 
It was a two month refurb, we're seven months in and I could go, oh my God, those builders are driving me crazy. This is so stressful, I'm going crazy, I can't sleep, it's making me insane and instead I go to see my builders and well, this is a challenge, this is a situation, but it's going to change. I can see the light at the end of the tunnel and I play a little song by E17 called All Right, All Right, everything is going to be all right. Every time I go to meet my builders, I sing that song. I could walk along going, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. Another day when the kitchen hasn't shown up, the painting isn't finished, they haven't done this right, this is wrong. And there's never anybody there when I get there. They're always not there. There's always some problem. But I don't do that. I go, all right, all right, it's really going to be all right. Maybe I switch that to Bob Marley. Every little thing's going to be all right because that is the basis of our TT. Looking at why we believe these negative beliefs, that was your mother, your father, your grandmother who said things like, well, that doesn't work out. Don't draw attention to who are you to do that? That will never work. That's far too much. Don't expect that. Expect less. You'll never be disappointed. Well, you will. You'll be disappointed because you expected less. Expect more and you will get it. When my daughter was at school, she wanted to go to art college and a teacher actually said to her amazingly, why don't you apply for an art college that's not very good? because you'll definitely get in and then you won't be disappointed. I'm like, oh no, no, no. You apply for the best art school in England because you'll probably get in. And if you don't, well then you can go to the other one. She applied for the best, she got in. I really believe in reach for the stars because at least she'll end up with a moon. Think big, excite your imagination, use powerful words, turn it on, excite it, thrill it, delight it. Don't use negative words. So remember, every time you're talking to yourself, I, I can't leave the burger. I need cake to be happy. Who's gonna want to take on me with three kids and sell you? Like nobody's gonna want me because I don't earn enough money. I don't quite look right, I don't work out. Remember what you are doing. Your mind's job is to do what you tell it to and your job, and it's a great job, by the way, is to tell it really exciting things. I can, I will, I always decide it is your job every day to make sure those pictures in your mind are exciting and are positive, not negative. And if you change the pictures and change the words, you will change your life for the rest of your life. Why do we give the power for how we feel about ourselves to someone else? Why do we say, was that okay? Do I look okay in this? Was I good enough? Was that okay? Do you approve of me? Do you believe in me? You see, when we're born, we must find connection. Finding connection is what life is all about, connecting to other people. And when we're little, we are dependent. We are dependent children. And we need to know that we're safe, that other people approve us. We look at our parents and go, did I do okay? Is that good enough? Do you love me? And that makes sense because we're trying to find our place in the world. And we know that our survival is linked to the people we live with approving of us. The problem is that many of us never give this up. We go through life going, hey, do you approve of me? Am I okay? Do I look all right in this? What do you think? Was that good enough? And you have to understand a great truth. What other people think of you is none of your business. It only matters what you think of you. And here's the thing, if you could go through life making people like you, the very thing that makes one person like you will make someone else not like you. I was looking at the comments on one of my YouTube videos and someone went, oh, your voice, I love your voice. Your voice is so calming. I really like your voice. And someone else said, I can't stand her voice. I had to switch the whole thing off because that voice is so grating, so annoying and so phony. So two people, one liked my voice, one hated my voice, but it doesn't matter. It only matters that I am cool with my voice. So the number one fear of being judged is really not a fear of being judged, it's a fear of being rejected. You might not like me. 
I could create something, a blog, write a book, give a talk, and you could reject me. I could go on a date and you could say, oh no, this is not working at all. And I can go home feeling absolutely crushed. One of my favorite stories is when Meryl Streep was auditioning for the love interest in King Kong and the director said, Meryl, you're just not pretty enough for this part and you'll never make it as an actress. And she said, you know what, that's your opinion. In a sea of opinions, I think I'll find a different opinion. When Naomi Campbell was told, you know, it's very hard for black girls to get on the cover of Vogue, that door is shut, she said, well, I'll kick it open. And I love that because what they said very clearly is you cannot judge me. I am judging me. I've decided I'm pretty. I'm interesting. I'm worthy. You see, if you can decide you are worthy, that judgment alone will change your entire life. Don't give someone else the power to reject you. Don't give someone else the power to make you feel bad. Some of the most successful people in the world were told you'll never make it at school. You'll never be anything. The Oprah Winfrey's, the Tony Robbins, the Adele's, the Eminem's, the Ed Sheeran's of the world were told you're not gonna make it. Or they had a life without a father or without money and they were judged, but they bounced back because they decided, uh-uh, only I can judge me. I was told I'd never make it. I'd never amount to anything. I wasn't smart. I wasn't attractive. I was geeky and gawky. But I learned very early on that it doesn't matter what my teachers say. It matters what I say. And if you want to find out how our childhood has such an impact on this ability to judge ourselves so badly. So here's the truth. If you are judging you, you only have to do one thing, judge yourself better. I can do this. This is my area of excellence. No one can tell me I'm not good enough. I remember years ago, someone saying to me, I really don't like what you're wearing. I went, oh, I love it. I love this. I really liked it. So they couldn't tell me that. Someone told me once they didn't like my house, they didn't like my decoration, but I didn't care. Recently, someone said to me, you know, the lobby of your house looks like a hotel reception. I know, I love that look. They went, oh no, I hate that. I like mess and I like make, do and mend. And it was very interesting. We have a different idea. I love the orchids on a table and they like mess and craft work. And I don't like that, but that doesn't matter. They told me my house looked like a hotel lobby. I'm like, yeah, I know. I like that look. I know you don't. I do. They weren't judging me. They were expressing an opinion. That's their opinion. I have a different opinion. So please do not give someone the power to judge you badly. Don't walk through life going, what if you don't like me? What if you reject me? What if? Most people have been rejected. They've been dumped. They've been fired. They've been overlooked. Take a look at Shark Tank, or in the UK we call it Dragon's Den, where people have been laughed out of the studio and told that that will never work. One Direction didn't win X Factor, but they became the most successful boy band in history. Robert Downey Jr. went to jail. So did Martha Stewart. They were judged. They, were, they had a criminal record. So did Jeffrey Archer, but they came back and said, you can't judge me because I am judging me and I'm judging me as doing really well. I heard a story I love many years ago about a doctor who decided to run a marathon to raise money for his hospital. And he was out of shape. I mean, he was working 18 hour shifts. He wasn't going to the gym and he came almost last. And when he went back to the hospital, another doctor went, oh, hey, I heard you came almost last. That's so bad. He went, almost last? Oh, no. I came first in my category. What's your category? A doctor running from this hospital to raise money for a scanner. I came first. And I love that. He decided he came first. 
You can decide you are first in your category. No one can judge you. Become first in your category of judging yourself well. Your best life is when you are free of rejection. Decision means decide to cut off from rejecting yourself. You see, it's easy to go out on a date and go, well, I've got cellulite, I'm a single parent, I don't have anything to offer, I'm not interested, I'm not tall enough. You see, if you believe that, other people pick that up. And if you say, hey, I'm a single parent, that's an asset. I have love in my life, I've got this great kid. I have love and now I can have more love and my kid is an asset. Anyone I meet is gonna love me and love her too, because you get to choose. I promise you, I guarantee, if you stop judging yourself poorly and unfavorably and judge yourself better, you won't even care what other people think. They can think whatever they want to think, as long as you think good things about you, you won't hold back from this fear of judgment. You will fly, you're sore, You'll live an amazing life knowing that what you think about you matters. And when your kid comes home and says, Mommy, my friend said I'm not nice. My friend said I'm stupid. My friend said I wear horrible clothes. You ask them, what do you think? Well, I think it's good. When my daughter was little, the most important thing in the whole world on her birthday was that I made her a cake. I went to the effort of making a cake and I'd make her a jewelry box cake or a Barbie cake, but I had to make that cake because it mattered to her that I made it and I personalized it. And then I worked with the client and you know, my mom never bought me a shop bought cake on my birthday. She made cakes and it was so embarrassing. I wanted to go out and buy me one like my friends. Well, isn't that interesting? My daughter, it mattered more that I made it, and this person, it mattered more that her mother didn't make it and actually bought it. One of my clients of my mum used to sew all my clothes, and I thought that was such a loving thing till I went to school and the mean girls went, oh, you wear homemade clothes. That's yucky, that's horrible. And she said, and I learned to feel bad that my mother was making me these things out of love. So you get to choose. Are you going to let someone judge you and diminish you? You see, people are not busy judging you. When you go to yoga, no one's looking at you going, oh, you can't do the tree, you can't do the downward dog. They're far too busy trying to do their own pose to judge you. And if they are judging you, people who spend all their time judging you badly don't like themselves, they feel inadequate, and they want you to feel inadequate too. And your choice is never to give anyone permission to make you feel bad about yourself. Bounce back. How fast is your bounce back rate? You see, it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked back. What matters is how quickly you get back up again. And we or experience getting knocked back. Many of us think, well, successful people don't. They're born with a silver spoon in their mouth and they just live a life that's amazing, but that's not true. There are people we admire who've had incredible knockbacks. Robert Downey Jr. went to jail, but now he has yet again a stellar film career. Martha Stewart went to jail. Jeffrey Archer went to jail, but we don't, judge them for that. And even if we did, it wouldn't matter because they don't judge themselves. They understand that in the tapestry of your entire life, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do about it, what you make of it. And we really admire people who come back from adversity, who come back from knockbacks, who have something awful happen to them and back they come, bigger and bouncier than ever. So what is your bounce back factor like? When you get rejected, you say things like, it's the end of the world, I'll never get over it. It's a bit like the song you might sing. Do you sing, oh, it's all over, I'll never get better. It's the end of the world, I'll never fall in love again. Or do you do a Beyonce saying, I'm a survivor, I'm going to make it. You know, the song everybody loves, 
is glory a gainer. I will survive. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. I don't need you anymore because she's singing a survivor song. And many songs that we hear are very negative songs. I can't live if living is without you. I can't go on. I'll die if you leave me. You're the only girl in the world for me. You're the only guy. That is not true. Human beings are not weak and they're not fragile. They are super resilient. But often we don't even know that we're resilient and we use words like, this is going to kill me. This will break me. I'll die if that happens. I can't cope with that. It would kill me. It would finish me. It would be the end of the world. No, it wouldn't. You know what? I look back at my life and the things that I thought were the most painful, being rejected. I'm glad that happened. I'm so glad my first boyfriend dumped me. I'm delighted I was kicked out of college because I came back bigger than better. So many things happened that I could think, well, that was a tragedy, but it really wasn't. It wasn't the event, it's what I made of it. And we all experience hurt, rejection, knockbacks and setbacks, all of us. There's a very famous runner in England called Paula Radcliffe who was running a marathon and she didn't win. She was predicted to win and she didn't. And she said, I just knew I had to win the next one. I had to wait for the next marathon and win then. Some Olympic athletes, I had to wait four years to come back and win, but I was determined to come back and win. I was all about the winning. And it's very important to be all about the winning. One of the most effective ways to be able to have a big bounce back, to be like a big bouncy rubber ball, is to understand the difference between destructive criticism and constructive criticism. It's also to understand that although criticism may hurt you, your own criticism hurts you way, way, way more. So destructive criticism, you don't want to let that in. You want to understand that people who seem to get pleasure from hurting you, belittling you, rejecting you and criticizing you are unhappy people. One of my clients was an actor and he kept getting rejected and I gave him a cushion and it says there has never been a statue erected to a critic. I met a critic who critiqued books and he said, you know, I thought that was my job and I was very harsh and very cutting and it gave me great pleasure to things like, oh, this book should not be put down lightly. Indeed, it should be thrown as far away from the unfortunate reader as possible. He said, but then I wrote my own book and it got absolutely slated. And then I really realized what I was doing, making a living, laughing at people, mocking them, hurting them. He said, and I decided I didn't want to be a critic anymore because critics are not happy people. You know, if you've ever had to fire someone or dump someone, I bet it didn't give you pleasure. I bet you had to think, oh, I'm dreading telling this person I don't want to be with you. I'm going to say, look, it's not you, it's me. I'm just not ready. I can't get over someone else. Hardly any of us go, right, I'm going to dump you and hurt you and break your heart and I'm going to love it. Even if you have to fire someone, I've had to do that. I have never enjoyed it. I try to do it super nice. I go, listen, you're so great at this and this, but this is just not right for you. And in our company, if we can, we try to move people into other areas because it's never nice to hurt someone. But one person I had to let go, I told her, honestly, this is not the right job for you. But I really liked her. We stayed friends. I stayed in touch. And she often says, I'm so glad you let me go because you were right. This just wasn't the right job for me. And she bounced back because I didn't diminish her or belittle her. But before you believe that someone else has the power to diminish you, think about the times when you have had to let someone go in a relationship, in a business, in a career. How have you felt doing that? Probably not very good. And then understand that most people who have to let you go don't feel good either. And the people who are enjoying it 
I can promise you they are really unhappy people. If someone gets pleasure from someone else's misfortune, that's an unhappy person. But remember too that the most important word you will ever hear in your whole life are the words you say to yourself. So if you get dumped, you have to decide, well, this wasn't the right relationship. I want someone who loves me as much as I love them. If I'm giving and they're taking, that's not right. And if someone ends a relationship with you, remember this. Everything they loved about you is still there. When they packed their bags and left, they didn't put in that bag everything they loved about you. All the wonderful things they said in the beginning are still there. You're still the same person. You are still lovable. Sometimes you have what I call a starter relationship, like you have a starter home. It's lovely. You love your little student. You think, I've kind of grown out of this. I need someone being bigger. I don't want to live in the country and I would live in the city or vice versa. You can have starter relationships just like you have starter careers and just like you have starter homes. And that doesn't mean anything went wrong. It means this, your potential expands as you move towards it and you have no idea. You can't have any idea what your potential is because as you move towards it, it moves and it moves again and sometimes you find someone, it's all wonderful, and then you just grow out of them. You grow out of a career, you grow out of a place, a home, and it's good to have change. But the most important thing is to say that I have a bounce back factor. I'm going to bounce back from rejection, bounce back from feeling I was replaced, bounce back. And you need to look at all the people that you admire and realize that they suffer too. Kylie Minogue, one of my clients that I went to audition to be her backup dancer, I didn't get the part. I said, you know why, I'm not good enough. I went, no darling, you're too tall. Look at Kylie, all her dancers are the same height as her. She doesn't want someone tall because it makes her small. All Madonna's backing dancers are men. She doesn't have women backing dancers because she doesn't want anyone to be better than her. And she is an amazing dancer. She's very gifted. But if you went to audition to be one of Madonna's dancers, you'd be rejected if you were female. Not because you're not good. When my little girl was a baby, I got stopped in the street and I said, oh my God, this kid has got the most amazing hair. Can I book her for a modeling assignment for Gap? I'm like, sure. And so she, at five months old, did some modeling. Her picture was everywhere. It was lovely. And then they booked her again. And then they booked her a third time. We went for the casting, it's called. And they said, we don't want her. I said, why not? And they said, she's too pretty. You know, when people are buying baby clothes, if the baby's gorgeous, they don't look at the clothes. If we're selling baby toys or baby cribs and the baby's stunning like yours, I don't look at the crib. We need an ordinary baby. Yours is far too beautiful. And I love that, too beautiful to model. Think about that. Some actresses and actors go for a part and they go, no, this is the, not the lead. And you're too talented, too attractive, too noticeable. You'll outshine the lead character. So you can't have the supporting role. So often when you get rejected, you, you're too good too talented, too smart, too something. And even if that's not true, you can still decide, I'm gonna believe I was rejected because I was too good, too talented, too amazing, too something. You see, it's not the event, it's what it means to you. And you always get to choose the meaning. Events don't affect you. The meaning really, really does and you can change the meaning. Many years ago, I had a client who was a comedian and he was overweight and he went to get a part playing the fat guy and they said to him, oh no, you're too fat to play the fat guy. And he used that in his stand-up part, I'm too fat to play the fat guy. He laughed about it. He was a happy, fat comedian, he put it in his act. So remember, it's not about being rejected, it's about what you do about it. No one has the power to reject you unless you agree with everything they say. For you to be rejected, 
You have to agree with a person rejecting you. You know what? You never, ever, ever have to do that. I see people with a lot of phobias and phobias are very common and, and people who come in go, I've got this fear of flying, I've got this fear of heights, I've got this really terrible fear of public speaking, you know, I have to stand up at work and chair a meeting, I open my mouth and I go, uh, 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 and now I feel such an idiot, what's wrong with me? I'm just such a loser and they kind of beat themselves up, but you know, your brain is actually quite smart and it usually gives you a phobia because it thinks it's in your best interest to have it. Now I know that sounds kind of crazy, but the mind works like this. It always does what it really thinks is in your very, very best interest. If you have a phobia and you haven't managed to get rid of it, that's because your mind believes that somehow it's helping you. So here's the thing, if you go to the top of a very tall building and run to the window and look out, your stomach will drop and your mind will go, get away from the edge, you crazy fool, because millions of years after evolution, our brain still thinks if we stand right at the top of a high building, it should make us feel slightly sick. So we pull back and now it's saved us because that's our mind's job, keep you safe on the planet. So I totally understand the fear of heights and you, you can't fight that stuff. Vertigo is there for a reason, but you can rationalize with the mind. You can turn it down. You can say I'm safe. Look, there's a window this thick. I'm gonna stay here and breathe and keep saying I'm safe, I'm safe. And then the vertigo will go away because your mind is doing its job get you away from the ledge. And when you dialogue with your mind to go, it's not a ledge, it's a plate glass window and I'm safe, it will go, oh, okay, don't need to do my job. Here's another phobia. It is probably the most common phobia in the world, the fear of speaking in public. But you know, that's not the fear. It's a fear of being rejected. I work with so many people. I've worked with people who said, you know, I can't even go to my own wedding. I've had to cancel the wedding because I can't walk down the aisle. I've had grooms who fainted at their wedding rehearsal about giving the speech. I had someone who had to speak at a funeral. She said, you know what? I'd actually rather be in the coffin right now than give that speech because I am terrified. But they're not terrified of speaking in public. They are terrified of being rejected. And that's again, as far as your brain's concerned, that's kind of smart because here's the thing. We come onto the planet with two needs, find connection, avoid rejection. Imagine you can go back a few thousand years and you're born in a tribe and that tribe rejects you and they don't like you and they cast you out. You're not even going to make it. You can't live because you can't hunt and protect yourself alone. And so that's why we have a fear of rejection because our mind believes I must be accepted. I must be connected and then I'll live a long time. And of course you and I know that we could go and live in a little bed sit with a cat and live to 102, get all our groceries delivered and we don't die of rejection anymore. But our brain really hasn't caught up. So when people have phobias of public speaking, which is nothing more than a phobia of being rejected, the way to deal with that is to say that I cannot be rejected. Nobody can reject me without my permission. They can say mean things. They can be really mean, but you always get to choose whether you let it in or not. And so with phobias, you don't need to take medication. You don't need to beat yourself up. You need to dialogue with your mind. Your mind's job is to keep you here. It gives you phobias because it thinks that's useful. And often in your childhood, if a bird has flown into your face, if someone's thrown a spider at you, you develop a phobia because your mind will always go back to what something means. I've had many people with a fear of water who remembered almost drowning when they were a kid and now they can't get on a boat. Some of them can't even sit in a bath unless the water's only that much. And so I've worked with a lot of people who've got fears, but you can talk yourself out of a fear when you have a brilliant brain, which we all have, here's your choice. Rationalize why I feel so bad, I can't do heights, I'm scared of bees, I can't be out in the summer, I hate birds, or here's a smarter way, talk yourself out of my brain is trying to help me my mind is trying to protect me i'm going to talk to it and go thank you but i'm cool the bird is fine the spider is way more scared of me than i am of it and and it really works and i've had clients who within half an hour of a session can hold a spider in their arms i had a girl who came to me so freaked out about cats 20 minutes later she was stroking a cat in her lap going i can't quite believe it 
I recently did a Skype with a girl. Her mother said she's just about to go around the world and she's terrified of cats. And the mother said, wow, she's sending in pictures of holding cats, holding dogs. What have you done to her? I rewired her mind. I dialogued with it. I removed the phobia. I want to thank me for believing in me. I want to thank me for doing all this hard work. I want to thank me for having no days off. I want to thank me for, for never quitting. And most importantly, it requires self-belief because like me, some people might not believe in you, but you have to believe in you. So if you think you can, and if you think you can't, you're absolutely right because you are what you think. And every athlete, every Olympic athlete bar none, every celebrity, every rock star or actor that you see must believe in themselves. For people to believe in you as an athlete, as a performer, they have to believe in themselves first. They have to have a belief that is so strong so invincible, so consistent, so ever-present that others believe it. You know, Muhammad Ali said, I told myself I was the greatest before I really was the greatest, before it became true, and then it became true. What a concept, say, I'm the greatest and become the greatest. And we'll say to Michael Jordan, gosh, you're lucky. He said, I know the more I practice, the luckier I become. So what he's really saying is I have earned my greatness. And we often look at singers, we look at movie stars, and we think, well, that was easy. It isn't often easy. Ed Sheeran slept in parks. He busked in the street. He was determined to make it. He got a lot of rejection. He knew he had a phenomenal gift, a phenomenal talent, and he must share that with the world. He knew that. Eminem was laughed at when he became a rapper, but he knew that he was great, he was amazing, he was gifted, and if you're given that kind of talent, you certainly need to share it with God. Imagine if Eminem was a plumber, if Ed Sheeran was a builder, nothing wrong with that, but we'd have never got to share their greatness. So this single attribute people have of saying, I'm good at this, I'm great at this, this is my gift, this has got my name all over it. I was meant to do this. No one can do this better than me. There's a great story that Celine Dion sent a master tape to, I don't know, maybe Sony, could be any recording company. And she called them and said, what do you think? They said, we didn't like it. She said, you didn't listen to it. There is no way you could hear my voice and turn me down. They were so shocked. They went go and find that cassette, played it, made history, they signed her. But imagine if she went, oh, okay, yeah, I get it, you don't like my voice, all right, I'll do something else. We never would have heard that song, my heart will go on. So many people who are knocked back come back and go, no, 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 you don't understand. This is who I am, this is what I do. I have a gift, I have a voice, I have a talent. And that single attribute of knowing they're good and telling you without bragging, without even showing off, just saying, hey, this is my gift. This is my skill set. This is my area of excellence. No one can do this better than me. And imagine if you were a flight attendant and you had that gift to say, hey, you're in safe hands, to be the kind of parent that isn't intimidated by a school teacher because you know I am the best parent, I'm the best partner, I'm the best at what I do. Whatever you do, you can be the best at it. There's someone in London called Jane Ashley, she's Paul McCartney's girlfriend, and she makes cakes, only cakes. She doesn't make chicken recipes or pies, just cakes. She charges $800 for a cake. She's written books about cakes. She has a shop just selling cakes. And she's an expert at one thing. And she tells everyone, I am the best cake maker in the world. Imagine if you had that and you could say, my nursery school, my coffee bar is the very, very best because I'm the best. Because I promise you, if you don't believe in you, 
how can someone else believe in you? How can anyone believe in you if you don't believe in you? You have the power to access phenomenal potential to be the best, and you don't have to be famous. Not everybody wants that. But you can still be the best at what you do. I am the best hairdresser, bar none. I'm the best plumber. I'm the best contractor. I'm the best at having people round to my house and making a lovely dinner. And people just love hanging out with me because I'm so warm and friendly and caring and entertaining. Imagine that if you had such unshakable self-belief in your gift, your talent, your skill set, whatever it was. The other day I was saying to someone, oh, I can turn any cat. They were going, oh, I've got this cat. And I said, I can turn any cat. I can turn any cat with food and love because I can. I wasn't showing off. It's like, oh, give me this wild, crazy cat. I'll turn it into a true pussy cat because I can do that because I understand animals and they just need patience. They need dialogue. Don't have to be famous to do that. But I have a friend who was actually in the Boomtown Rats. He was a rock star. And when he left the Boomtown Rats, he also had that gift to turn any animal. And he created a whole company training animals to be on stage. He actually trains the corgis that you see in the crown. He's trained so many animals to be in adverts, to be on the screen, because it's his gift. And he'll say, oh, give me an animal. I can train any animal with love, with words. I can make your pet famous if you want me to. And he really can, but he doesn't brag. That's his gift. So imagine if you had that unshakable confidence in your voice, that unshakable conviction, that unstoppable knowing no one can do this better than me because it's my gift. It's what I was meant to do. It's what I was put on the planet to do. You might hear people say, oh, I love babies. I've got a gift with babies. I'm really good with horses. I'm really good with people. I'm great with old people. I love listening to their stories. And it's not bragging. It's stating the truth. Find out what you're good at. Tell everybody and make that a statement of truth. Have you ever seen a child, especially a baby, say, I'm not enough? Imagine the first day that you're born and people come to the hospital to see you and grandma or aunt, your uncle or brother or sister or dad starts to count your fingers and toes and the doctors and nurses look at you. New baby says, don't look at me. I've got these milk spots. I don't have any teeth. I've got triple knees. I've got a leaking diaper. Babies don't, when you look at a baby, they smile, their big gummy smile, they kick their little legs. I used to push my little daughter out in her stroller. who were looking to go, wow, what a gorgeous baby. And she never looked away. She would smile, her big gummy smile without any teeth and kick her little legs with her triple knees and her chubby ankles. And she joined in with them and going, hey, yeah, look at me, aren't I the cutest thing? And many of us find that hard to even believe, really? I came onto the planet and I liked attention, absolutely. In fact, babies demand attention. They cry in the middle of the night. They grab hold of your leg. They insist you pick them up because they have a belief that runs them and it's this belief, I am worth it. So all babies are born with this belief. Someone is going to come and meet my needs. Babies will cry for hours because the belief is someone is going to come and take care of me, feed me, change me, hold me, love me, be with me, because I'm worth it. No baby says, well, I'm not a rich baby, so I don't deserve love. I don't have designer clothes. I don't have a flat stomach. I don't have a thigh gap or a bikini bridge. They don't even know what that is. No baby says, I'm not attractive, I'm not smart, I'm not worthy, I'm not enough. No baby says, well, I'm just a stupid one. I just, I, I just have this self-sabotage, I destroy everything. So it's important to understand that even if you may have forgotten, you were born like every single baby wired to make it. That's why a baby falls down, they get up. They fall down, they get up. 
they learn to feed themselves, they learn to go to the bathroom, they get it all wrong but no one says, yeah, you know, I never, never really got to grips with that going to the bathroom thing, it was just so complicated, I, I just gave up. No one does that because babies are wired to keep going, to keep going. They are like magnets wired to succeed at walking, talking, speaking, feeding. And you learn half of what you learn in your entire life before you're five years old. And that should be amazing, except many of us learn way before we're five. Oh, my mum's unhappy, so I'm not enough. My dad left, so I'm not enough. My mother prefers my brother, I guess I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not, I'm not good enough. You know, one of my clients, every minute she was born, her mother would say, oh, I want an angel, I've got a devil. She's the devil. She's up all night and sleeps all day. She'd be the death of me. She said it in a very joking way, she loved that baby, but the baby picked up, oh, you want an angel? And you got me, people say, oh, your baby's so cute, come back at 2 a.m., you can have it. He's not cute, he's a nightmare, he's the devil. You have no idea what he's like. Or we change the baby's nap, you go, oh, this is so disgusting, oh, yuck. And we forget that babies who are pure sensation pick that up, they pick up our voice tones, they pick up everything. People holding the baby on the hip go, yeah, well, she nearly killed me. I almost died giving birth to her. She ruined my body, ruined my relationship. So often parents say weird things like, I love you so much, I could eat you. That's a really weird thing to say to a baby, I love you so much, I could eat you. But we never stop to think about what we're saying to our children. And often we say these things to protect our child. Don't do that, it will all go wrong. Don't ask for that, you'll never get it. I want, doesn't get. Don't show off, don't draw attention to yourself. Who are you to ask for that? Don't put your hand up all the time. Don't take the attention of other people. And most of our parents do that because they really want to protect us. They're acting off their own limiting beliefs that when you start to label a child you're the greedy one you're the noisy one oh this is my problem child I was in the park with a friend and she said this is my problem child she loved that child she had four children this is the problem child and I did have to say very nicely don't keep saying that in front of him because you know you are wiring him to become the problem child that is now his identity and so adults do it to protect us, to keep us safe. They do it as a joke. They do it because they think it's funny. But they pass on these limiting beliefs. People pass on a limiting beliefs from parent to child to the next child. And then we begin this negative self-talk, this negative dialogue. I can't. I shouldn't, I mustn't, it's greedy to ask, it's greedy to want. Who am I to have more than other people? I shouldn't ask for more. People won't like me if I ask more. Nobody will like me if I'm different. I shouldn't show off. I should keep everything in. Don't cry, don't have a tantrum, don't make a fuss. And the problem is that this is bad enough on its own, but then we develop this limiting self-talk. I better not ask, I might not get. I shouldn't demand, I'll seem greedy. I better be nice, I better be good. I better, be, I better please everyone else because the only way I can get my needs met is to make other people happy. And we have these beliefs that really belong in our childhood. And it's such a shame. But at any time in your life, you can change your beliefs, you can upgrade them and find you and you know I've upgraded my phone if I hadn't I'd still have this old Nokia brick I loved my Nokia brick and I thought oh, actually I don't want that anymore I think I'll have a Blackberry I think I'll have an Ericsson and now I have an Apple I don't even know what number it is but I upgrade my phone every time a new better one comes out and that is exactly how it should be with your thinking upgrade your thoughts leave behind the ones that don't work don't carry around an old Nokia brick 
that isn't even charged and go, well, I don't know why this doesn't work. It, it worked 10 years ago. I'm just going to keep pressing the buttons because it's gone. You've upgraded it. And it's really time to upgrade your thoughts, upgrade your beliefs, upgrade the way you talk to yourself, the way you talk to yourself, your self-talk and your self-dialogue will define who you are, where you go and what you do. Yes, someone asks you, oh, hey, you're just the best thing in the world, you're the hottest thing, the smartest thing, the kindest thing. I could say to my assistant, you're the best assistant I've ever had in this company, you're the best. By the way, could you work all weekend? Could you stay late? Because you see, dialogue can manipulate people. So when other people praise you, they might just have an agenda. They don't always, sometimes they do. But when you praise you, there's no agenda. It sinks in. Whatever you say, good or bad, right or wrong, your mind lets it in. In fact, your mind doesn't care. And it doesn't even know if what you tell it is good or bad, right or wrong, useful or useless, helpful or not empowering or disempowering, true or false. And since that is true, you might as well begin to tell yourself amazing things. You see, you make your beliefs and then your beliefs turn right around and make you. So imagine this, I always mess up. I always get things wrong. I always blow it at the last minute. I seem to forget the most important things. When it comes to talking to people, I go bright red, I break out in a sweat, I panic, and I don't know what to say. Now these are words, and you can choose to say them, but you can also choose to say, I'm phenomenal. I always know what to say. The right things come to me. I'm so at ease around people. I just have a knack for making things work. My life is extraordinary. You can choose to be negative, you can choose to be positive. You know what, you can't choose what you do to your body when you go, that's gonna go wrong. I knew I'd mess that up. Everything I touch falls apart. I'm just a loser. I'm just stupid, I'm an idiot. I got rocks for brains. I always mess it up. You can't choose what that does to you. But you can choose to flip that over I'm wired for success. Success comes to me. I'm naturally good at people. I have a gift for this one thing. I was given this gift. It's what I'm meant to do. I'm really good at it. I can do this. This has my name all over. I can do this. Yes, I'm doing it. This is working out amazing. This is what I was meant to be, meant to do. This has my name. I can do this standing on my head. You see, you might go, well, that's a lie. But so is saying I've just got rocks for brains because that's definitely a lie. And if you're going to tell yourself a lie, how about telling yourself a better lie? Everything I touch falls apart. Whatever I put my mind to, it works out amazingly. Remember, your mind doesn't know, doesn't care. So you might as well tell yourself amazing things when you change your self-talk, when you change your dialogue and make it positive, your life becomes extraordinary. Here's a good example. I'm chronically tired. I'm dying of fatigue. Well, that's not true. How about, I'm a little bit tired. I'm also dehydrated. Tonight, I'm gonna have a great night's sleep. Tomorrow, I'll be full of energy. I look at a cake and I get fat. That's a lie. Why not say I look at a cake I don't even like cake, but on the odd times I eat it, I just burn it all off because I've got a fabulous metabolic rate. You're beginning to see that you get to choose. And if you want to learn more about how to really make yourself talk a masterpiece, make yourself dialogue so phenomenal that you can't help but become phenomenal, then please join my 21-day Unstoppable Confidence Challenge, where you are going to not just hear me talk, you're going to be invited to take action, to do things, to wire in, fire in, and code in phenomenal habits of being unstoppable. Check out my next video here. Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to share that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I die.
why if I've got to go on stage? I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday.